The Tuesday, February 2nd, 2016 meeting of the Plainfield Plan Commission is in session. I'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Paris. Here. Commissioner Sagerbrook. Here. Commissioner Renzi. Here. Commissioner Kiefer. Here. Mr. Heinen. Here. Mr. Green. Here. Chairman Subkoviak. Here. Park District. School District. Fire District. Library District. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, do you have from your packets the minutes of our last meeting? Uh, that of uh, January 19th. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? I have uh, one on page four uh, where it says Commissioner Green indicated he would like to discuss the possibility of all premium products in between their premium and products it would be all premium siding products and uh, then and no vinyl siding and I think that would be uh, a little more complete. Are there any other additions or corrections? If not, the minutes will be accepted as presented, as amended. Is there anyone in the audience who care to ask a question or make a comment regarding something that is not on our agenda? Something not on our agenda. We'll let the record show that there was no response. Development report, staff. Uh, the village board did meet last night, uh, the uh, only meeting between uh, since the last plan commission meeting, and uh, there were no development cases uh, considered last night. But uh, staff will mention just one item for uh, interest for the uh, for the commission. Um, the village board did approve a, a contract for uh, some landscape design work for uh, Settlers Park and a Veterans Memorial uh, Plaza area here, kind of adjacent to Settlers Park. Uh, we've been in Village Hall for uh, what 12, 13, 14 years now. And uh, there are some maintenance uh, items and, and uh, things of that nature at Settlers Park that need some attention. So uh, just for the Planning Commission's interest, uh, uh, Settlers Park will be getting a little bit of a enhancement here over the spring and summer. And uh, in addition, that includes some work uh, in the Veterans Memorial uh, Plaza area. Uh, and some of that has been uh, funded through donations and gifts uh, for the specific purpose of those improvements. So okay, thank you. <coughs> Jonathan, I, s I saw that uh, Pace is going to be using they had a contract with Larry's Diner for parking. Is that going to be uh, to supplement the village That's hall use or uh, in uh, addition? We're, Is it we're very, very grateful, both the village and uh, Pace are very grateful for the owners at Larry's Diner to agree to provide 75 spaces uh, there. Uh, that will be a supplemental pickup area, uh, and they're still working out what routes, if both routes. There are, as you know, multiple sure. routes and, and uh, bus departures each morning, um, but we're hoping that that will alleviate some of the pressure on parking uh, both here within the Village Hall lot and also on uh, Van Dyke Road and Ottawa Street. Uh, sure. Thank you. And that, that begins uh, March 7th, I believe. Okay, thank you. Under old business, we have a continuation of case number 1710-122915.A. Adam, A. Adam, A. Adam, slash SMU Union, slash P. Paul, P. Paul, slash F. Frank, B. Palm. This is a play of VISTA, uh, and the request is for a major change to the plan development and preliminary and final plats. Uh, staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you know, this case was uh, considered uh, at the last meeting of the Planning Commission and was continued to uh, this evening's meeting, and uh, so staff would ask that the record reflect the public hearing, uh, which was posted and published for uh, our original uh, meeting date, is, is continued and is uh, still in effect. Um, as the Commission will recall, uh, we discussed this case at the last meeting, um, and the, uh, actually let me take a step back, just provide some site context, uh, you know, I, I know the uh, Commission recalls, but for the public, uh, the site is located generally south of 135th Street and east of Ridge Road. Um, it was considered at our uh, last meeting, uh, the applicant is requesting uh, approval to eliminate uh, the age-targeted marketing component of this project, uh, make it uh, available and, and uh, appropriate for kind of all ages. And uh, to implement that change, they would also introduce a series of conventional uh, two-story home types that would supplement the existing 
uh, ranch home product that has already been approved previously and would continue to be offered uh, in combination with the two-story homes. Uh, when the case was considered last, uh, there were two uh, primary open areas for discussion, uh, those pertaining to coordination with the park district and with the school district. And so staff and the petitioner have taken the two weeks uh, hence from the uh, previous meeting to advance those discussions and we can kind of lay out uh, where things stand uh, in that regard. Um, if I may uh, also just kind of summarize or reiterate uh, the timeline for the, uh, this component of Grand Park, um, because I kind of touched on it verbally in my staff report, but I didn't lay it out in detail and, and certainly not on paper. Um, the project that's before the commission this evening, which is referred to as Playa Vista, is actually three neighborhoods of the original Grand Park approval. There are neighborhoods four, five, and six. Um, as approved in 2001, uh, this pod or this, this neighborhood was contemplated uh, for an age-restricted uh, senior development uh, to contain up to 718 homes, 718 dwelling units. Um, in um, 2007, well actually let me pause for just a second. So in, in the 2001 annexation agreement, uh, given that it was age-restricted, uh, which would virtually preclude uh, school-aged children uh, the school district, Oswego Land School District, agreed that there would be no uh, impact fees associated with uh, the housing uh, in, this in these three neighborhoods. Um, likewise, um, the park district uh, considered the park obligations for the overall Grand Park development, uh, the 880 acres, uh, and they accepted uh, a significant uh, land donation of, um, get the details here, 168 acres of land that was dedicated to the park district. Uh, in addition, there was a, uh, 120 acre, 121 acres of private open space uh, within Grand Park for the association to maintain. And furthermore, the developer agreed that there would be an impact pay, a fee paid uh, per dwelling unit. So there was a combination, really a three-pronged method of satisfying the park obligation for the, the project in total. Uh, which includes these three uh, so-called neighborhoods of, of Grand Park. Uh, in 2007, Hearts Construction uh, came to the village and proposed a specific development proposal that would carry forth the concept of the 2001 annexation agreement. And at that time, they proposed to build 407 uh, age-restricted homes. Um, at the time, the, uh, annexation, the terms of the annexation agreement uh, were still um, appropriate given that it was an age restricted community. Uh, in 2012, uh, uh, again recognizing the timeline uh, of the economic downturn, the housing downturn, Hart certainly faced some challenges in, in, the, in their time trying to market the age restricted project. Uh, they petitioned to the village to um, amend uh, that agreement and broaden the market slightly uh, to include age targeted housing. So by eliminating the age restriction, uh, it introduced the possibility that there could be some school-aged children. And in 2012, uh, Hearts Construction uh, reached an agreement with Oswego, Land, or, or Oswego School District 308 uh, to pay a cash in lieu fee uh, per housing unit to address the school impact from the development. Uh, that ca cash in lieu fee was $3,000 per unit, which is consistent with uh, all the other um, dwelling units within Grand Park. Um, except there, there was a neighborhood for apartments which also were not anticipated to generate children. But by and large, the $3,000 per unit fee is, is what each uh, housing unit within Grand Park pays uh, to address the school impact. Um, given that at the time in 2012, uh, the age-targeted community still proposed a private clubhouse and some recreation amenities for the residents there, uh, the Swiegel and Park District uh, was satisfied that the, uh, again, the overall park donation uh, private park space and cash in lieu fee uh, would continue to satisfy the, the park needs uh, for the community. So that brings us forward to today and uh, by moving from age targeted to having no age restrictions at all, um, let me uh, uh, again address the positions of both the school district and the park district. Uh, the school district reiterates uh, that its agreement from 2012 uh, is still uh, applicable. They're still satisfied with the, the terms of that agreement. Uh, they verified as recently as today that the district has the capacity to um, serve the students that can be expected to come from this neighborhood. The developer will continue to pay the $3,000 per unit uh, cash in lieu fee. 
and uh, the park uh, the school district is uh, comfortable, has no concerns, and in fact uh, used the term that they support the, the project as, as proposed. Uh, they indicated they would have sent a representative uh, if not for some scheduling conflicts, so they, they would have been happy to uh, come before the commission this evening and, and uh, address that in person. I know uh, we did distribute a letter uh, that you should have before you that summarizes um, you know, some of, some of that directly, so that's current correspondence. Um, with respect to attendance zones, um, the Playa Vista project is currently within the uh, attendance boundary for um, the Grand Park Elementary School, as well as the Murphy Junior High School. Um, however, the district notes that those attendance zones are you know, subject to change, so there can be no assurance in the future. Uh, as with any uh, school district with a growing, you know, developing population, uh, boundaries are, are uh, sure to, to adjust from time to time. Um, so it's staff's belief, I, I believe it's the, the petitioner's understanding uh, that District 308 is comfortable with the uh, petition that's before the commission this evening. Switching gears to the park district, um, while the overall park obligation for the project has been satisfied uh, by the 168 acres of public open space dedication, the 128 acres of, or 121 acres of uh, private open space that's maintained by the association, and the continued payment of uh, cash in lieu impact fees. Um, the park district did express uh, uh, the interest of providing for the recreation needs of its future uh, park district residents uh, within Playa Vista, and specifically uh, by going to an, uh, an, a conventional subdivision with no age restrictions. Uh, the park district foresees the potential uh, need for uh, recreation amenities for, for children uh, in this area. And it's their wish that those children would not um, be left with the option of you know, crossing busy streets to, to access recreation. So the park district is requesting uh, open space dedication, a park dedication uh, to the park district uh, from within the Playa Vista site. Uh, it's staff's belief that the petitioner is comfortable with that. There is, um, uh, let's see if I can find a spot here. Yeah, you can kind of see. Uh, this is approximately 8.5 acres uh, starting from this uh, roundabout area and encompassing the detention pond. The park district is requesting approximately four and a half acres and uh, staff believe this, that there's uh, sufficient site, uh, site area available for that park donation. Uh, we're continuing coordination between the petitioner and the park district and are looking to schedule a meeting as soon as this week to confirm uh, some of these details. But um, staff represents that the current proposal uh, again, recognizing that this is over and above uh, any uh, ordinance requirement for a park obligation, uh, but the current proposal is to provide a, a public uh, park dedication to the Oswego Land Park District, uh, primarily to meet the uh, recreation needs for, for children within the development, uh, which would be over and above uh, what would be required by ordinance by, or by the annexation agreement, uh, but both the petitioner and the uh, park district are, you know, feel that that's a benefit and are uh, agreeable to doing so. Um, so those are kind of the two um, main areas uh, of discussion from the, the past meeting. I know there were some additional uh, areas of discussion. We can continue that this evening. Uh, staff did uh, request of the petitioner that they be prepared to speak to um, how the homeowner association um, associations might function, uh, specifically this one existing townhome building to remain a six unit, six home townhome <coughs> building. Uh, which would have its own association and as well fall under a master association uh, for common area maintenance. And uh, staff's asked the petitioner to address, you know, that that would not be an unfair burden or um, uh, undue cost. Uh, and in addition, um, I recall a, a commission may have had a few other questions that aren't uh, covered here by this, this general summary, but um, Overall, uh, staff believes that the uh, project meets the requirements of the uh, village's zoning code, um, that the housing product itself conforms to the residential design guidelines for planned developments, uh, that the issues uh, with respect to school and park districts have been addressed, and uh, prior to any additional questions or uh, public comments, staff would be seeking a favorable recommendation. That concludes the staff report. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Mr. Martin, representing uh, Playa Vista. Uh, I see you have a, a, a large group of people with you. Uh, have any are any of these people who have not been sworn in at the previous meeting? Okay, very good. Then I then I would remind you all that you are 
uh, still uh, under oath. And, and please proceed with anything you have to add tonight. Pardon me? Wrap it a good one. There you go. That That's it, yeah. <coughs> I came down with some bad laryngitis between the last meeting and tonight. Um, I have a lot of notes, but uh, maybe the best thing is just to talk to you. Um, regarding the school district, um, when a developer considers a school district or uh, its impact uh, on a school district, you can basically consider three things. One is the land donation, which is required by ordinance and statute, state statute. And the next is the assessed value of the homes when they, when they come online and start being taxpayers, and the major portion of that bill is to the school district. Um, and what happened in the housing boom uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s uh, mostly is these homes were built so fast uh, that uh, the, they were sending children to the schools and impacting the schools and the assessed value was not catching up and the taxes weren't kicking in for two or three years down the road. So what happened is the villages started passing impact fee ordinances, those who had home rule powers, just as Plainfield did. So then we added a third component to the donations that a developer has to consider and how a development pays for its impact on the school district. In this specific case, uh, this was part of the Grand Park subdivision. Neighborhood, these neighborhoods were included in the calculations for making that land donation to the school district. So that had already been satisfied when we bought the subdivision or my client bought the subdivision. And in fact, Grand Park and the developers of Grand Park over donated to the school district because the calculations based on the total Grand Park area, including this neighborhood, called for a donation of 22 acres. My cli that client, which at one point was my client too, but not for that uh, project, um, donated over 30. So an excess donation of more than a million dollars was paid to the school district, and the two schools which were con contemplated in 2001, an elementary school and a middle school, were built and are there today. So th that's how the land donation was addressed. Additionally, this neighborhood was contemplated for over 700 uh, age-restricted homes. And the, and the caveat on that was that if less than 45% of them, uh, you know, or, or if it dropped below 45% in age restriction, then they would start paying impact fees of $3,000 per unit. So that gives you about 400 units that could actually have been sold to people that would send children to the school. So that was actually considered in, in the calculations. Um, I think the third thing that's appropriate to consider is that building boom has gone. This subdivision with 320 units, uh, if my client is lucky and fortunate based on their experience, will sell maybe 20 to 25 homes uh, a year. It's going to be 15 to 20 years before there's a full build out and children from this subdivision, if you start doing bedroom counts, are actually attending the schools at full build out. Um, but whatever you consider, I think the important thing to look at is we came online in 2007, we built the units that are existing as age restricted, and we didn't pay impact fees for those units. In 2012, when we came back because we're not selling and we waited, we came back five years later, we went to age targeted. At that time, this was considered again, the impact on the schools. And at that time, we agreed that we would pay a $3,000 per unit impact fee back in 2012. The problem is we haven't sold anything. We haven't built anything, so we haven't paid that impact fee for any age-targeted units because nothing sold and nothing was constructed. But the same impacts were considered by the village in 2001 and 2012. And we're here today, and the school has, and we've met with the school, and the school has said, impact fee, $3,000, honor it. We're happy to honor it. So we're at that point where we believe 
we should go forward. Uh, if you sit down and you do bedroom counts, we, we went from 407 units that could send children to the school, and we're going down to 321. So we really aren't impacting any greater than the agreement that we agreed to in 2012 when we came back and asked for age, age targeted. So that's the school. Regarding the park, again, the donation was made in excess of 168 acres and $8 million over the required donation was made to the park district. The park district has come back and said, and this was gonna be homeowners association open space. And in 2012, the park district didn't want it with our senior, you know, at the clubhouse and the pool and, and all of those things. Um, now they want a neighborhood park. That's not a problem. We would be happy to take that off the homeowners association, the maintenance. We don't want to build a tot lot. We don't want to pay liability insurance. We don't think a homeowners association would be able to carry that obligation. And if something went up, it would probably be torn down later. So that's ideal. They want four acres. Four acres, by the way, if we came in with this subdivision, not considering the the, the prior donation would satisfy the state statute and the village ordinance for a donation from this subdivision to the park district on its own accord. We wouldn't have to donate anymore. But we're making an, a donation that we don't have to make because it's a great idea. We're happy to have the park district put a park in there and we're happy also, and the problem is we haven't had the schedules coordinate to meet with them, but we're happy to have them uh, take the bike path too. We'll build it and give it to them. And they can have it and they can maintain it. So there's a continuity 20 years from now when something has to be done with the bike path that the park district owns it and they control it and they can, they can make it. And we don't have to worry about homeowners associations coming up with money that they don't have uh, to do something to a bike path that may need improvement or repair. So those are excellent things. Those are things that we're willing to do uh, to cooperate. Um, the problem is the subdivision hasn't sold. So we're trying to come to a point where we have something that we can market and something that can get built and something that can, you know, it's good for the village, it's good for us, it will generate a, a large amount of those impact fees if it starts selling out, and it's better to have something there than to have a vacant lot. And that's basically what it is right now is a large vacant lot. Um, Everything that we have asked when we cut down the number of units to 321 single family homes, uh, although that includes um, uh, the units that are also up, by the way, with the school district, we have also gone back and agreed to pay $3,000 for each one of those units, which has, hasn't sold yet, the 10 units. So when we sell those units, we're going to be paying another $30,000 to the school district uh, as, part of, as part of our agreement with the school district. And those are things that we will present to the village uh, in the amended annexation agreement when we have a hearing in front of the trustees so that they can, they can consider that. Um, regarding, um, I think the um, issue was the homeowners association or one of the issues was the homeowners association. Um, maybe I had, it didn't explain it well, but you have six owners taking care of one townhome building unit. All they have to do is cut the grass and shovel the snow. That's the same that would have happened if we had built all the townhomes, except those homeowners in addition would be paying for the clubhouse, would be paying for the pool, and they would be paying for the other things which are basically hopefully going to just boil down to the entrance monuments and maintaining of the detention ponds. That appears to be what the overall homeowners association will contribute to. That townhome unit will be treated as one home in the overall homeowners association. So those folks pay one sixth of the dues one home will pay for maintaining the, the pond and, or the ponds and uh, the entrance monuments. They actually will be paying less. Of course, they have to pay for reserves for exterior maintenance of their building, but they're not gonna pay any more than they would have paid, and actually they will be paying less uh, regarding the, the homeowners uh, association. Um, there was the question on the vinyl siding, which I think was uh, uh, addressed uh, in, in the correction to the minutes. Um, the vinyl siding meets the village requirements. 
Um, we have vinyl siding because we want to deliver a home at a certain price point. We haven't been able to sell. If we put, say, hardy board in place of the vinyl siding, we triple the cost of the siding. And we're not going to be able to deliver the homes we want to deliver at the price points. The vinyl siding, there's six different variations of how it's applied. There's different colors, and there's different combinations with the bricks. So you're not going to get cookie cutter look in the subdivision at all. Finally, if somebody really wants hardy board siding, we'll give them a quote and we'll put it on. But we're not going, we're not, we don't want to market it at that point, and we have met the village ordinance. In fact, we are trying to meet every village ordinance that exists without asking for variations. I mentioned there is one variation regarding um, the, uh, the side yard in the gold color area going down to eight feet. But that's not really treated as a variance because the variances for our, our units in the past were in the amended annexation agreements. So just like the schools and the parks, that's in front of the village board when they consider the amended annexation agreement. So that is the only request that we have regarding any of the village setbacks, the size of the lots. Uh, and what we really want to do is we want to start selling the homes and building the neighborhood. By doing this, by ripping out the water and sewer from the multifamily and putting up the models, my client is prepared this year to invest more than $5 million without seeing any return at this time to try and get the subdivision going and trying to get the homes built. And as I, I told you, we expect maybe 20 to 25 homes a year, and that would be a good year for us in this market, from this area, and from the subdivision, and at these price points. Have I answered most of your questions? Can I answer any others? Not at this time. May, may, uh but uh, we'll, we'll probably get back to you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who care to ask a question or make a comment regarding this development, this project? Please step up here to the microphone. Would you raise your right hand, please? Is any testimony you give tonight the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you? Yes, sir. Okay, please state your name and spell it, and then go ahead. My name is Kathy Crawford, C-A-T-H-Y, Crawford, C-R-A-W-F-R-D. I would just like to make note in regards to the school district. I've been back and forth between the village hall meetings and the school board districts, and I know it was recommended that we shouldn't be coming back to complain to the village of Hall in regards to overcrowding at Grand Park Elementary and that I should be fighting the school district in regards to this. And I just want to make note that, yes, I have done that, and I have gone to our superintendent who is going to be no longer as of June 30th. So I have a feeling this is why I keep hitting a, a brick wall. But I just wanted everyone to know, I don't know why the school district is saying they can handle this capacity. Grand Park Elementary is currently enrolled at 665 students. Our capacity at Grand Park Elementary is 725. We're at 91% capacity. That saying, there is 100 kindergarten students, mine included, that will be attending Eastview Elementary School. The current plans as of last night at the facilities planning committee, they stated that they are going to get rid of the uh, kindergartners, send them back to their home schools, which we have 100 of them over at Eastview. So they're sending them back to Grand Park Elementary. We're exceeding capacity at that time. So just kind of wanted to make it noted that I know the school district is going through reboundering. They're gonna be reboundering the school in 2016, 2017, and then those will take effect 2017 and 2018. So, little nervous about how everything is going to take effect and just wanted to kind of talk about how we can build that relationship with the school district a little bit more with our planning committee so um, I have advised the school district to kind of reach out to the village of Plainfield a little you know upset that they're not here this evening representing them as well and discussing how this impact is going to affect the Grand Park community and our children but I agree and love the um, idea that the um, Hearts Homes will be single family homes now and completely support the agreement, but I want to make it known that yes, we are at capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any rebuttal, um, uh, Mr. Martin? Not for you, no. Okay. Is there anyone else who would care to ask a question or make a comment regarding this project? Okay, well, with that, then the commissioners are free to uh, 
ask questions of staff or uh, the petitioner. So I'll start. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank the applicant in regards to you know continuing uh, your case, um, you know, till until tonight. You know, as you know, one of my my concerns was you know with the school district, and again, I'm hearing this from from Grand Park, my residents, my fellow residents. Um, and uh, you know, two weeks ago, there was a conflict in regards to you know some of the residents actually attending a school district meeting. So I thought it would be appropriate to continue it so that we can you know hear from those residents. Um, so I thank Kathy for for speaking here tonight. You know, I think. She, she spoke well in regards to a lot of the concerns um, from uh, the residents of Grand Park. And again, I know this isn't your issue. Um, I know this is a school district issue. And that's why I was just hoping that the school district, you know, could come here tonight to kind of, you know, explain their vision in regards to, you know, the next three, four, or five years uh, as this development comes along online, as KHAV is building out Somerset, as there may be apartments that you know uh, may start construction here soon in Grand Park. So how that is all going to be planned? I think that's what the, the residents of Grand Park wanted to hear tonight, um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. You know, I do appreciate the the school district writing a letter um, to the president and, and to the trustees of the Village of Plainfield. I mean, it's a letter that pretty much stated the facts, um, and it talked about you know having the flexibility. And I understand. I understand they need flexibility because it's a growing community. Um, but again, I just wanted to hear their vision. You know, what is their vision over the next, you know, three, five years for this area as we grow up? So that was a concern. That's a concern that I relayed on, or I'm trying to relay on from the residents of, of uh, Grand Park. And uh, I just got a text saying that um, the um, television broadcast tonight's um, has in technical difficulties because I know a lot of the residents of Grand Park wanted to watch this tonight too. So it seems like it's getting a double whammy here. I think perhaps that the best venue to address this would be to go to uh, Oswego School District and um, comment and petition them directly. Right. No, I understand. Anybody else? Can I just say thank you? We, we were happy to cooperate. Yeah. No, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank Jonathan for all the legwork here and uh, procuring the, uh, the letters from uh, the park district and the school district uh, it clar clarifies the issues for us. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you, Mr. Martin, for, uh, for your help in uh, uh, clarifying this matter also. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was happy to see some clarification on the Homeowners Association, especially in regards to that, the townhouse, how that was going to work. Um, the park district, I think that development's a good one. Uh, that they're going to take over that parkland. There was some concern at the last meeting how the residents would maintain that. I think that's good. In your testimony, Mr. Martin, you, you indicated something about the bike paths also might be included. Is, yeah, they, is that part they, of the discussion? Or is that we just haven't had that discussion, tonight? but we're trying to get the meeting, and I want to offer them the bike path. And as I said, we'll build it and give it to them. I think that's I, the I think perfect. that makes sense, too. I know that was one of the concerns about long-term, how that was going to look and who would maintain it. So. I think that would be. Well, we're wise. planning on crushed limestone, but I don't know if that's what the park, park district wants. Okay, thank you. Real quick regarding that. Um, so I noticed the bike path on 127th is built in pretty much adjacent to the stormwater detention facility, but it stops at, you know, those green lots. Is there a reason why that stops and doesn't extend all the way to the east property line? Uh, okay, uh, at the north end, you mean here? So on 127th Street. Yeah, that's south, south of 127th. The, yeah. There's an existing bike path. It goes to the front and goes along the front entrance. But it also goes on 127th Street. Okay. So does it? Is yeah, I, I'm saying 135th, but I'm sorry. It goes along 135th. I meant 135th Street. Oh, okay. I meant 135th Street. Yeah, no, it's supposed to tie into wherever another bike path comes across 135th. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not sure exactly where that is. So, Jonathan, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? So there's a bike path that comes from, I believe it's from their west property line, and then goes, yeah, through the intersection. No, and then... It's, do it's down here. It, it starts down here and goes up. I'm actually, I'm just talking specifically in regards to 135th Street. Okay. Um, because I know a lot of residents kind of run and bike along that stretch. Yeah. So there's a path that runs from your west property line 
to your entrance drive and then yeah. proceeds east and then stops right there. Yeah, like right okay. there. Why does it stop there and why doesn't it extend all the way to your east property line? You know, I think that's one of the things we want to clear up with the park, park district. Where yeah. do they want us to put it and tie it in? Because right now I don't know if they want it running through the middle of the park. Um, so that's one of the things we don't have um, a set and we never got to discuss bike path with them. Yeah. But before we go to the village board uh, and present the amended annexation agreement, I won't bring it forward until we have that answered. I don't know. If you could work with the applicant in regards to, you know, I, I believe it stops there. You know, it'd be nice to have that extended the whole way because I know there's a lot of residents that go down 135th Street. So thank you. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead. Okay. Right. I'll go. <laughs> All right. I had, uh, I had one question first, uh, and I made me think about it when I was looking at the, because uh, I know we have another case a little later on that's next to that Oswego fire station. And I was on the planning commission back in 2001 when Grand Park was originally approved. Uh, but is the entire Grand Park development served by the Plainfield Fire District, or does Oswego okay. Fire District serve part of this? Do we know that? In fact, since we have a representative here tonight, maybe. No, the Kendall County portion is in Oswego. It's Oswego. The Kendall County portion, right? Okay, which would include this, correct? No. No? Yeah. Wouldn't it? I don't know where. We're all, county we're all Kendall. Well, county, I know where the county is. We're all Kendall that? County. The original Grand Park was 880 acres, and only the eastern 80 acres is in Will County. The other 800 acres is in Kendall County, that's in which would include this. Yeah, that's all in this. So Park. I guess my point is I think our amendment or our. our uh, if we get to our down here to our we're gonna have to no. amend that to say Oswego fire protection district correct okay yeah so that was one one thing uh, well both well but yeah okay you're right this part yeah, of development yeah. would only be in yeah, Oswego right. fire protection yeah. district so because uh, that's kind of a you know that'd be a kind of a, a big misnomer to say it's under Plainfield if it's really under the Oswego I know they got a their station is obviously much closer than the closest playing fields. And, and John and I had discussed that it, it, the resolution says 355 homes. It should be 321. Right. Total. I think you meant right. last time you corrected. And we need the wording right. approved final plat of unit two right. of, uh, in there. So anyway, uh, so that was one thing. Uh, I think I wanted to echo a couple of the other commissioners. I mean, I, it looks like a lot of progress has been made in the last couple of weeks. So uh, I think the thought on the HOA dues makes some sense. It sounds like the park district thing is going to be a win-win. It looks, sounds like it's really going to work out well. The school district, a little more problematic, but it's a bigger problem of growth. And, you know, there'll be some challenges there as to, you know, where the kids may eventually go to school. But that's something that's, you know, kind of beyond our purview anyway. I mean, it's tough. I mean, it, right, if those schools are already nearing capacity now, well, then that's something the school district's going to have to address, you know. Uh, the one thing I brought up last time, and I, I'm still, and I, I merely, this is more for going forward to the village board. I mean, I understand the challenges you went through. I remember in 2012 when you came back, and I think you asked us to kind of approve some different looks on the elevations, different materials, and what had been proposed originally. Uh, and we had the letter at the last meeting from the one owner of the townhouse unit. I, I still think the idea of just isolating this one townhouse building by itself and then <laughs> the potential for these ranch units the more i think about it i mean i find it interesting you're presenting a new pattern book and every single house you're showing even on the small lots is a two-story house so i guess what i'd like you to tell me is why can't you present some ranch models i understand you don't want to stay with that you know reti so-called retiree you know ranch <coughs> unit that you already built the models of but i think you've built two of those on the one street we will build the ranch units. We're asking to continue I, okay, but in, the, in that gold area. Right, I if, understand if that. If someone but, is interested in purchasing uh, that. I mean, the gentleman at the meeting last time was, you know, basically saying, look, because I haven't been able to be marketed that, I, you know, I, I was getting the sense that, you know what, we're just going to throw in the towel on those. But, I, I mean, if those were really designed as empty nester retiree type housing, I, and, I mean, I'm looking at your pattern book for the two-story houses on these smaller lots, and, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure why you're not coming up with at least one ranch model on 
not only on the smaller lots, but even on some of the bigger lots. Well, the, the, the existing ranch model can be sold as a three-bedroom ranch model with a basement, right. and we still will be selling those if there's an interest in buying them. Right oh, now, I under- there's right. been I understand no interest. That, but you're probably not going to take one of those and put it on one of your new larger lots. Is my no, opinion. not at all. So what I'm saying is, I, and this again, going forward to the village board, I think you should at least think about offering a ranch model different than you know, the old, the retiree ranch models you built originally, only because not everybody wants a two-story house. And, I mean, again, we talk about monotony. I mean, I, you look at some of the, the nicer developments we have, I think you see some very nice-looking ranch houses, you know, kind of scattering it among the two stories, and it, it ends up creating kind of a nice look. I mean, it's a nice blend. And to be honest, the ranch houses often cost as much or more than the two-story units. Because you can certainly build cheaper up than you can out. So uh, I, I would just like you to think about that going forward. But, I mean, I understand, you know, you've already got the ranch models built. You know, basically that design's done. If somebody wants that kind of, you can build another one. But I'd like you to think about a ranch model for these other newer, larger lots so that you can offer a little more variety. And, again, you know, for those two people that bought, built those two ranch units, I'd sure hate to think of that you know, all the way up and down that street on both sides, all two-story houses, and then we've got these two little ranch units sitting there like that. It, it's just, you know, it, it's not a good look. I mean, it's a better look if we can get a blend, you know. And to be honest, not everybody, you know, nobody wants a two-story house. I mean, I, I mean, I know what you're saying. Oh, gee, it didn't work as a retiree community, but I think you're going to find, as the market does come back, that you may still be selling some people, you know, over 55 that, may or may not have kids some of them may still have kids but they don't want the two-story house they may just want a ranch with a basement so john that, did you have something oh um yeah uh jonathan <clears throat> uh what's the square footage we currently have on the books for single family housing is it a minimum of twelve thousand square feet that's a lot or a lot of it. yes thank you the lots for single family housing uh the zoning code for R1 zoning district straight R1 zoning with no relief or no plan development is 12,000 square feet. That's correct. So when we're talking lots that are, oh, 6,000 and some change square feet, um, that's, oh, roughly a little better than only half the size of what we're targeting, right? That's on the books, right? What was the reasoning for that? Was it potentially that... uh, people don't want to have yard maintenance if they're retired, age-restricted type development? Was that the reason we kind of... I don't think it had anything to do with age. age. Well, there, there I a, lot of, a lot of people are uh, your age uh, <laughs> don't want a big yard either. Yes, I appreciate that, Jonathan. So if, if I understand your question correctly, you're, you're inquiring that the area that's that's currently in gold, um, mm-hmm. where that's a, a, at the, the smaller lot size, what the rationale was for approving that yes. is... Um, <clears throat> my understanding is that it would reflect um, the style of home, uh, the um, the streetscape that was um, all part of the, the uh, original proposed development. So, um, and that was an age restricted development, right? Originally age restricted, and then amended to age targeted. Okay. So if we remove all age restricting and targeting and all that those houses will sell at a considerable lower price than say the newly redesigned lots they shown in green on the diagram up there right i i mean i can defer to the well, applicant I, mean, I i think it's it's probably premature to speculate on on price differences uh from one to the other i think that they will be lower probably on average the, if, if, if a comparable home is built in a green lot versus a blue lot versus an orange lot, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't speak to what price difference the lot size would make if it's the same home, but relative to the, uh, the uh, square footage, the amenities of the home, uh, I'm not sure that the lot size would be a significant factor in the cost. And they're proposing to use vinyl siding on these smaller lots and smaller square footage housing, right? They're uh, maintaining, or, yeah, they're not requesting any variation from the, the mm-hmm. elevations that were most recently approved in 2012. So what I fear, and I'll get to the question here, uh, is that we're building in a future slum, or at least lower income housing, that's going to be surrounded by, um, you know, better housing. And I'm, what I think 
is there the potential, do you think, uh, to drag down the value of all the existing housing in Grand Park and around the area if it's associated with these tiny houses, tiny lots, and vinyl siding? Is there the potential there, uh, do you think? Well, I, I certainly wouldn't agree with the characterization that these homes are going to be tiny, uh, but let me just um, represent that the uh, product that's being proposed, um, you know, staff is evaluated, worked with the petitioner uh, extensively, and, um, you know, we submit that it's consistent with the village's residential design guidelines uh, in terms of any uh, concern about um, a lot sizes or compatibility. I think if the developer had, had uh, their way, uh, they would like a clean slate here. Unfortunately, uh, some utilities, some infrastructure has been constructed, and they're, they're trying to make the best of that. Uh, they are removing a substantial uh, portion of uh, utilities and, and regrading uh, areas where, <coughs> excuse me, there aren't existing homes, where there aren't existing residents. Uh, so uh, in, the, in the area that's in gold, the, the die has been cast to a certain extent, uh, and they are going to spend a significant sum to um, uh, re regrade and, and um, uh, resubdivide the remaining area. Uh, be <clears throat> would it be possible to keep the age targeted restriction on the gold and uh, remove it on the rest and have two different type of uh, special use or zoning uh, for what's planned? From you know, from a zoning standpoint, um, certainly that's that's uh, feasible. Uh, and, and what's practical from a marketing standpoint, certainly you know, welcome input from the from the petitioner, but. Um, I think uh, so staff certainly understands your concern. Um, I believe that the the neighborhood, when it's when it's built out, uh, will be compatible, and the area, the gold area, the blue area, and the green area, uh, w will be compatible. We'll have home types that are consistent, and um, the variation in lot sizes will will be neg negligible. Will not uh, result in negative impacts. That's uh, staff's belief. I mean, I would agree with Jonathan on that. I mean, uh, you know, they have obviously tried to sell the senior product in this area and it hasn't worked. Um, and I hate to mandate that or, or encourage that. Um, you know, in regards to, you know, different price points, I mean, Grand Park actually does have a wide variety of, of price points already. I mean, there's some houses that are in the high twos and then go up to, you know, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000. So, I mean, there's a wide variety in the area. If we're going to say, you know, these gold lots or units are going to bring you know down the value of grand park i would challenge that i don't think that's the case i think it's really you know where with each pod and in each individual house too so uh, I, I wouldn't be too concerned about that and mr chairman if i, I may add it's it's uh, a little bit off topic to the to the zoning issues that are at hand but um this a subdivision this development will be known as playa vista and other than you know those, those of us here the village board uh, the folks in general um, I, I think to the general public this will not be part of grand park and um, i'm not here to, to say it should be or shouldn't be that's not really the position i'm trying to make but i think for for uh, uh, the general public this will not be seen as a unit of, of grand park it's, it's just a byproduct of being included in that original annexation agreement but uh, this area would not have access to the, the clubhouse, um, you know, the, the Grand Park clubhouse. Uh, it won't have uh, the unifying uh, neighborhood uh, signage, decorative lighting, the other elements that uh, are consistent throughout Grand Park. So uh, this area of, in and of itself will be, in my opinion, uh, somewhat of an isolated neighborhood relative to uh, being confused or, or compared with Grand Park. And that's not to say it shouldn't be, and uh, that's definitely not to say staff feels that there's a, a risk that this would be uh, a negative connotation to Grand Park, but I, I just wanted to make that point that it, it's uh, kind of its, its own animal. And one, one last, real quick, one last thing in regards to lot size. You know, there are lots within Grand Park, you know, Somerset, that just got approved by KHOB. They're, you know, roughly 8,000 square feet, you know, not too far from, you know, these lots. So there, that's a more, a little more dense development. And, you know, it's kind of nice having higher denser, lower density. It's, you know, kind of a mix. And I can kind of see that fitting within this. So just my thoughts. Anyone else? Um, just, I guess, to bring it all back, uh, <coughs> with what Jonathan said, if you drive down 135th Street from Route 30, you pass 10 
different subdivision signs. So uh, it's <coughs> built out, yes, but every place kind of has a little bit different look. And we, I think as long as I've been here on the Planning Commission, we've made a point to never define happiness or uh, anything by square footage of lots. And if the builder has a good idea or a good concept, we can look at smaller lots. And basically, the one thing that everybody can agree about estate lots is that when you have five acres upon five acres upon five acres, you're somewhere in the, not next county, but the county adjacent to the next county. And so this is a good way of uh, limiting sprawl and also with good design work we can have it where uh, you can have the looks that the uh, commissioner was talking about but the only point that I would make is I agree with Commissioner Segbrook because as the applicant was speaking of like 15 years to build out well we haven't had any real construction along Ridge Road but it's also finally and the curve has gone through so you don't have to make a detour onto 126 have a four-way stop to go down to I-80 you can actually drive straight through now that may or may not have an effect on development but we're now in 2016 the subdivision doesn't project to be built out till 2030 so there could be very well some commercial development well yeah along. Ridge I mean Ridge Road is actually what will be at some later point we we were hoping it would be by now right, but exactly. that will be the wickaduke trail right so i'm thinking that possibly uh some models of as said ranch houses interspersed along because in my subdivision again I'm talking about that but we have some ranches in our subdivision too but i'm thinking just for anti-monotony and also uh anticipating some sort of little bit of a difference in 2022 say as opposed to now and what's gone in the past because i think if the past has taught us anything it's that we don't really know anything at all about the future so i think the more options that are on the table the better but i also agree with uh, the sentiments that said uh, as to the uh, park district and the uh, school district that it's good to hear from all of them and to get all that answered and uh, thank you mr. Martin for answering I had sorted other questions pen through but in your touch I just checked them all off so thank you for that and with that I am done if I could just say the existing price points on the ranch models uh, vary from about two hundred and ninety thousand to three hundred and forty two thousand and that's without upgrades for yeah, um, the thing the point every, a lot of people are missing is small lots don't mean small houses and they They're don't need necessarily inexpensive either. It amounts to. Uh, my my son has a Hart's home in New Lenox. It's got a 6,500 foot uh, yard, and he loves it because he don't have to cut all that blankety blank grass. <laughs> right, but I mean, my they gave us a pattern book here, and they've got three sets of standards, design standards for three different size lots. So I mean, if I'm going by this on these small lots they're going to be doing this you know more compact two-story house with a garage two-story two-car garage typically tucked under the house because that's the only way it's going to fit on the lot and they've got the larger for the the larger lots that are up to ten thousand still two-car garage but starting to spread out and then they've got the third pattern for the big lots where we're going to get some three-car garages and everything so they have a nice variety but my point is at least on those smaller lots I, you know, I think it's a little short-sighted to say they're all going to be two-story houses. I still think they should be looking at a ranch model. Different than the so-called retiree ranch model they started with originally. Okay, anybody else got anything? If not, then the chair would welcome a motion. Reg regarding, the, uh, regarding the change for plan development. Mr. Chairman, so, if, I may, yes. um, if I may just uh, uh, add a clarification to my, my suggested motion, and I apologize for the confusion. Uh, as Mr. Martin noted, uh, the correct unit total is 321 units total, uh, of which 308 are to be constructed and, and the, the balance have been constructed. 
and then uh, through the right. modern. Uh, okay, the does everyone understand that? Yes, and then okay. reference to the Oswego. Uh, yeah, and the uh, Marvels of Technology to the there. Fire District should be Oswego rather than Plain. It's actually Plain, Plainfield Fire District. Yeah, Mary's, Mary Ludeman confirmed for me through the uh, Wonders of Technology here. So, okay. so that is correct. So it Plainfield, is Plainfield is correct. So it is, so it is correct. <coughs> okay. Mary, Mary has spoken. <laughs> Is this? Pardon me? Yeah. Entertain a motion? Yes. Uh, I move we recommend approval of the requested major change to the plan development for the project known as Playa Vista to permit 321 single family detached homes subject to the following two stipulations found in staff report. One, compliance with the requirements of the village engineer, and two, compliance with the requirements of the Plainfield Fire Protection District. I'll second that. A motion has been made and seconded to recommend to the village board the approval of the requested major change to a planned development for the project known as Playa Vista to permit 321 single family detached homes subject to the two stipulations found in the planner's report. Vote by roll call, please. Mr. Heinen. Yes. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Renzi. Yes. Mr. Sagerbrook. Yes. Mr. Paris. Yes. Mr. Kiefer? Yes. Chairman Sapkowiak? Yes. Motion to recommend approval of the uh, major change is uh, carried. Uh, regarding the um, uh, preliminary and final plat of subdivision. So I move we recommend approval of the Playa Vista Unit 2 subdivision following, uh, subject to the following two stipulations highlighted in staff's, staff's report. I can second that. A motion has been made and seconded to recommend to the village board the approval of the Playa Vista Unit 2 subdivision subject to the two stipulations found in the planner's report. Vote by roll call, please. Commissioner Kiefer? Yes. Commissioner Green? No. Commissioner Paris? Yes. Commissioner Sagerbrook? Yes. Mr. Renzi? Yes. Mr. Heinen? Yes. Chairman Sokoviak? Yes. Motion to uh, recommend approval of the uh, <coughs> Uh, preliminary and final plan of subdivision for Playa Vista is carried. Uh, both of these two recommendations will go forward to the village board for their approval. Uh, they will be available to them by their next meeting. However, be in touch with staff to ensure what night you're actually on their agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your hard work, sir. Under new business. Case number 1711-010516.SAMU Union slash SMP Paul R. Raymond. This is a um, uh, request for special use and site plan review for an outlot and uh, at the Plainfield Meyer Plaza 3. Staff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you noted, the case that's before the commission this evening is a uh, site plan review for a new uh, retail building at the Meyer Project. And in addition, the petitioner is requesting special use approval uh, to prevent a drive through window operation as part of this retail building. Uh, the special use request does re uh, require a, a public hearing, and staff would ask that the record reflect that the appropriate notices uh, have been uh, mailed and published in accordance with state statute and local ordinance. Uh, in terms of the project that's before the uh, plan commission this evening, um, this is within the Meyer uh, development at the southeast corner of Route 59 and 135th Street. Uh, this is, I believe, the third or uh, fourth project uh, of multiple buildings that have uh, been brought forth by the petitioner, uh, including most recently uh, the building at the hard corner there of 59 and 135th Street, which uh, now includes a Pet Supplies Plus and AT&T, uh, among other users. And then farther to the east, the O'Reilly Auto Parts um, and uh, those kind of twin retail buildings there. So. This is the third in a series of uh, projects that the petitioner has uh, brought forth to the village board. Uh, what's being requested uh, this evening is approval of a three-unit, uh, you know, multi-tenant retail building of approximately 9,000 square feet. Uh, it's located immediately south of uh, the hard corner there and immediately north of a right-in, a right-out access drive. So we'll uh, kind of skip ahead to a site plan here. Um, Vehicular access is taken uh, from the main Meyer access drive, uh, two locations. So there's uh, ingress, egress here in the northeast corner, as well as an uh, um, opportunity for access at the southeast corner. Um, the site circulation is um, oriented primarily counterclockwise uh, through the site. 
uh, kind of one way here uh, along where the uh, proposed pickup window would be, uh, and then two way uh, all the way around, and there's uh, uh, access along the rear of the building here as well. Um, pedestrian uh, access is provided uh, by a sidewalk along um, Route 59. Uh, in terms of parking, uh, the petitioner is proposing um, a total of 71 parking spaces. Uh, at a minimum, the zoning code would, re would require 30 spaces uh, if it were strictly general retail. So uh, clearly there's uh, an excess of parking. Uh, if if uh, higher parking generating use were uh, to occupy one of the retail spaces, for example, a quick service restaurant or, or a cafe, there's uh, sufficient supplemental parking to, to meet those parking needs. So staff is confident that 71 spaces are, are uh, sufficient. Um, regarding uh, engineering and stormwater management, uh, as an outlot of Meyer, uh, this project, uh, the stormwater is included in the overall Meyer development stormwater management plan, uh, so no on-site uh, stormwater detention is required, and uh, staff is confident that any additional um, site development engineering issues would be, would be uh, minimal. Uh, staff did evaluate the proposed site plan uh, against the uh, standards of the zoning code for B3 and verifies that it complies with all aspects of the lot area, lot width, building height, floor area ratio, and, and setbacks. Uh, taking a look at the building's elevations, uh, the proposed uh, building materials, um, elevations, and architectural treatment are consistent with the uh, uh, previously approved um, buildings uh, uh, presented by the petitioner and, and under construction near and completion. Uh, so staff really has no uh, suggestions, has identified no uh, issues uh, with respect to the uh, retail. Uh, staff believes that the proposed materials and the architecture elevations are uh, well in compliance with the site plan review ordinance. Uh, in addition, staff's reviewed the uh, proposed landscaping plan uh, for the project and uh, feels that the required landscaping uh, has been met, including uh, parkway tree plantings along Route 59 and uh, all of the on-site uh, landscaping. Uh, likewise, the petitioner did submit a photometric plan, uh, which demonstrates that the uh, light levels dissipate to the uh, required minimums at the, at the property line. And then the last uh, point of evaluation uh, pertains to the uh, proposed uh, trash enclosure here, um, so that uh, demonstrates that the uh, trash enclosure would be constructed with materials consistent with those of the um, principal building. Uh, in terms of the analysis of a drive-through, um, as the Planning Commission uh, is aware, uh, the Commission must make two findings of fact before recommending approval of a special use. Uh, and those findings are, uh, one, that the special use would not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other properties in the immediate area, uh, nor would it diminish property values in the neighborhood. Uh, staff finds that the drive-through would not be uh, detrimental to adjacent properties, nor would it diminish property values. Uh, the drive through window operation um, is compatible with the vehicular circulation within the site. There is a uh, room available for a bypass lane. Uh, there's adequate uh, room for uh, stacking. Um, staff uh, feels that there would be no negative impacts from the operation of the drive through window that would be um, injurious to adjacent properties. And then the second finding effect is that the establishment of the special use uh, would not impede or orderly development of adjacent properties uh, for uses already permitted in the zoning district. Uh, this is um, one of the last uh, uh, areas available for development, um, so there's very limited potential for negative impact, but uh, having said that, clearly the trend of a development in the area is to uh, include drive through window operations. There are countless examples uh, within a stone's throw of the subject site, and uh, staff would submit that um, by approving a drive through window operation at this location, it would not um, um, impede the, the trend of development in the area. Uh, so that's a very brief uh, summary of staff's analysis, uh, but in conclusion, uh, we feel that the uh, proposed uh, site plan, uh, elevations, landscaping, and lighting are in compliance with the village's site plan review ordinance. Uh, pertaining to the special use request, we feel that the uh, findings of fact can be demonstrated to support a favorable recommendation, and as such, we would be seeking a recommendation for approval of both. And that concludes the staff report. Thank you, Jonathan. Who's, re who's representing the petitioner? Would you step up to this microphone, please? Would you raise your right hand, please? Is there any testimony you give tonight, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you? 
Okay, when, when, when you begin to speak, please uh, state your name and spell it for our recording secretary, and then proceed with any comments uh, or any additions to the staff report. Um, <clears throat> my name is David Mangerton, M-A-N-G-U-R-T-E-N. Um, I'm a principal with the architectural firm of KMA and Associates, Inc. Architects at 1161 Lake Cook Road in uh, Deerfield, Illinois. Um, this developer, in addition to the lots that um, Jonathan's mentioned on this property, he, he also has developed the three lots um, north of 135th in front of Menard. So he's, I've, I've been before this uh, uh, plan commission several times and, and our client has uh, uh, found uh, Plainfield sort of a home. So he's a corporate citizen, I guess. Um, as Jonathan said, the, the property that, um, I guess I'm out of battery. Um, the property is just south of um, the corner property which, which uh, houses the, uh, soon to house the Pet Supplies Plus and the AT&T store. Um, Jonathan, could you put the plan up, please? Site, site plan. Thank you. Um, in addition to the two entrances along the ring road, um, we're utilizing a cross easement that staff had asked for, or perhaps the plan commission had asked for when we developed the corner piece. So I think that also helps the circulation um, of this property. As Jonathan had said, um, we're using the same materials as um, the other developments, um, other two developments, and the uh, second twin building, um, <coughs> Uh, next to the O'Reilly's building, we hope to come in for a building permit um, in the next three or four months, actually. So there's enough interest um, at this intersection that my client would like to um, add this building to the other uh, three buildings uh, that have been approved. Um, the uh, parapet walls screen the uh, rooftop units and we're using the same uh, color palette as the other buildings um, and that's in deference to um, the uh, PUD that was created by uh, Myers. Um, that's really all I have to say. I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who care to ask a question or make a comment? Regarding this uh, this project, let oh, the record show there was no response. Uh, commissioners, you're free to ask questions of staff or uh, the petitioner. Nothing. <clears throat> so basically, um, drive-through, but uh, it's a considerable distance to the closest residential, and it looks like it'll be pointing. Headlights will be pointing uh, to the west, right? Correct. Towards Route 59. Across Route 59, is it a residential or commercial? Commercial. Uh, the use to the west is commercial. Okay. So it shouldn't impact any residences then? That's correct. So, Jonathan, my concerns about the site plan uh, I think have to do with the corners, the northeast corner and southeast corner of the property. Um, you know, we got our trash enclosures there. Um, and I, I, I just wish we could get a you know a bigger setback off that ring road and i know this isn't a public road this is all private but it's just you know with those developments that that you know we built previously it just seems like those drives um and that parking is so close to that ring road it's hard to get any land you know meaningful landscaping in there um but i think you know the location of those trash enclosures and the location at least of that south entrance is concerning because of site distances um, you know that the let's take the entrance at the southeast corner it is right right next to the um, you know main the one of the main thoroughfares uh, for entering and exiting the Meyer subdivision and that's and that's so close to you know the intersection um, I don't know if there's a way of taking a look at that again and seeing if you can get more separation and possibly moving that trash enclosure so it's not a 
um, you know, a sight distance or, you know, a sight triangle issue, you know, from that intersection. Well, and, and you oh. made a reference to uh, trying to get some meaningful, you know, uh, landscaping in there. And that's one of my concerns, especially on that ring road, is that it, as that matures, it really does affect the sight lines. And they, yeah. it, the trash enclosures themselves are going to be, I think, problematic. But the, the landscaping as it grows, and that ring road is pretty much treated like a street. We know it's not a street, but that is essentially the street that runs through the western part of that the Meyer development. And currently the ones that are there, some of that landscaping is becoming, I think, an issue for, for safety when you're driving. So, But I, I agree with the yeah. trash enclosures that that could be moved back a little. Has that been looked at? The, there's no question we can move the trash enclosure. Um, uh, it works well with the service aisle, especially the one at the northeast corner. But I think um, we have an opportunity to move the one uh, at the south for sure um, and um, and if we move move it then then perhaps that we claim some uh, green space yeah the thing I think you want to analyze is you're, n you're not showing the drive aisles for Meyer subdivision and how your your uh, entrance drive to yours how does that align with the you know the drives for you know, Meyer on the other side of the ring road. I think that's going to be kind of important too, so you don't have conflicting movements, you know, in and out of there. So, so I think that needs to be analyzed, Jonathan. If you can work with the applicant on that, I appreciate it. While we're talking about access, and I want to talk about the uh, northwest corner. Even with some sort of traffic control device, I'm really concerned with anybody coming in because they're going to be coming from the north at a like a 45 degree angle and they're going to come right into people leaving the drive through and people going around them for the drive through so that seems to be an invitation for an accident at the uh, I guess it's the north northwest corner and I'm because the one thing that, w I mean, design, I understand how it can work and we have the drive through lane, but when we put it all together, I'm a little concerned at the area right between the uh, green that's built out into like a triangle so you can have parallel parking and then built out so you can have handicapped parking and there's that little space between where conceivably three cars could all be converging on at the same time and there's no real place for anybody to go. And so I have I've identified the problem, but ever since I got the packet, I can't figure out how so what solution we should have for it. Um, so I'll turn to the applicant. How do you figure that's gonna well, work? Well, and first of all, um, as in the case of all drive-throughs, the, there will be some control. You know, the, the people exiting the drive-through will have a, have stopped. There'll be a stop bar. There'll be a stop sign. Are they, are they planning? Are you planning on having, depending on what goes in there, some sort of overflow for if your whatever your pickup is not ready to go? Okay, park there. There's the right. There's ample parking, so that that opportunity is there. Um, but if the commissioner is concerned about traffic coming from the uh, Pet Supplies Plus um, AT&T site, um, we can put controls there as well. Um, but the traffic pattern is such that everybody is going to be coming southbound. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, the drive through actually has an opportunity to go north. It c could go back onto the AT&T property. Right. And that, that would only create a problem for anybody that wants to go around the, in the bypass lane and all of a sudden you're turning right directly in front of someone who's in the bypass lane. And that also goes to where that car goes to if you're envisioning the overflow parking for the drive-through should be 
the diagonal parking at the north end of the lot, well, you still have the same problem, but maybe that's a better problem than if you're envisioning pulling straight through and their overflow parking is to the west because then anybody that's coming from parts plus, they would have to and they would be backing up. So basically, I just see a, a mess occurring. I mean, I'm a lawyer, so I'm trained to view everything as the worst possible scenario. But I can see where there's three people at the drive-thru, two have ordered something that takes 20 minutes to prepare, so they're parking somewhere. Somebody else is running from the AT&T to the other store, and someone else is in a hurry and going around the bypass lane, and someone else is placing an order, and all of a sudden we have this confluence of five cars right there. I, I, but I, I'm, if, we, if we don't look at that, as Guy is my witness, I'm sure that's going to happen. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's the one thing that uh, the years of lawyers taught me that eventually all my nightmares come true. There's, you can laugh, but it's true. There's, um, I, I always think of um, the concern of, you know, traffic because there's a way traffic, because there's a way that cars can travel that they will travel there. But there's several issues. They're not driving on Route 59. They're driving five miles an hour or less. They, the, the cars are stopped either at the window or coming from the north. So it's, it's a kind of like a controlled intersection, you might say. What you portrayed was, I, I, I guess, a scenario that if it, if it could happen, it would happen. But I, I think it's not like you're driving on you know, on a street, you're driving in a parking lot. And, um, but I mean, what we could do is we could perhaps give up a parking space to the north so that there's a little bit more buffer if, if, that, if that would um, help the cars that are leaving go <coughs> north. Look at that intersection. But I think um, if you, that kind of diagonal had to be there because the parking field is different on the north um, and the other parking lot. I, 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 that, that I understand. And that's, that's the problem is that I can understand that we have to build it this way if we want everything to work. But the problem is, you know, maybe it's a combination of traffic control devices, speed bumps, and because uh, we know it can't be brains with drivers because you can say that they're going to obey stop signs or yield signs. They're just going to go right through and they're not going to drive 5 to 10 miles an hour. They're going to drive 25 to 30 miles an hour. Uh, well, I guess from, from my perspective, I'm not as worried about that, that intersection in the northwest corner. Um, you know, again, I think it's what we really need to focus on is this ring road and, and these entrance drives, because that's where a lot of your traffic's going to, you know, actually is because of the Meyer subdivision and all the other developments, and that's where it's a little bit faster too. Yeah, um, that 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 is true. There, well, I would say it's going to be a lot faster. So, in that same line of thought, then, Andy, would you that north your northern entrance drive on the ring road then? Yeah. I mean, if, if really you look at the traffic pattern you've got there, I, I understand you've got a bypass lane for the drive through but, I mean, anybody that's going to bypass that drive through for whatever reason, I, I'm not sure we want to make that northern driveway wide enough that they'd have an opportunity to try and, you know, do an, a 180 back out onto the ring road. I mean, if they're going to bypass the drive through they must have been thinking of, you know, going in the drive through anyway, and you've got that as set up as a one-way going to the west. I'm not sure that that northern driveway entrance, you couldn't narrow it up some more. So it's essentially it's a one way in from either direction the on the ring road. It, the other guy wants to narrow it. Yeah. The northern, the north, the northern driveway. North. Uh, I mean, why would you want people in that bypass lane to have an opportunity to go back out onto the ring road? You know what I'm saying? I, they should all have to turn to the west if they're, if they're bothering to bypass the drive through lane. You know, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I think I, I do. Um, so, so that that driveway would only be westbound. 
it would basically only be westbound, and the, the, the entrance onto the ring road is really just an entry drive, not an exit drive. You don't want to encourage people to try, you know, they're really turning the wrong way against the flow of traffic. But you, you may want to allow cars out there only for the main fact that to the south, that takes you back into one of the more well, I know, major entrances. Again, look at your ring road. Look what it does there. It makes a sharp yeah, turn. But it's going to bottleneck it's everything blind, down. It's a blind spot. I'd rather really get in the southeast. I'd rather get the cars it. farther north out. Yeah. Right. One I thing mean, I've noticed from just from a site plan perspective, so the required parking is uh, 50. We're providing 71. You know, so what's the purpose of the five stalls behind or on the east side of the building? Well, first of all, the, the, the analysis for the restaurant load hasn't been done yet. Okay. So um, or initially there was a restaurant of a certain size that wanted 70 cars or whatever the number was. Okay. That is ongoing with the developer and the restaurant tour and so we were those become employee spots they're not prime spots um, well the reason why I bring it up is because if we could actually eliminate those spots you could really clean up that whole area in the back because what's happening is that those those spots are really pushing your drive your north-south drive behind the building east and that's why you get that small landscaped area you know, at the pinch point, you're probably only looking a couple feet. I mean, it'd be nice if you could push that whole drive to the west, closer to the building, to get more of a landscaped area there. And then you probably have more opportunity of, of shifting that southeast entrance, you know, farther north to get it away from that intersection, the main intersection, you know, southeast of it, too. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, I think the, the driveway has to stay in line with it with that east-west drive on the south side of the building. Well, I'm saying let's move it. Well, no, it doesn't have to. Well, I mean, you don't want it to dead end into the building. I mean, I think from a planning standpoint, I think it, you know, we can um, readjust it's it. Like if, if you move the, if you move the, the north-south drive closer to the building, then you're getting farther separation from the ring road where that car can actually make that, you know, come farther north and then turn. Oh, you're talking about not moving the driveway necessarily, but making the um, trip, the... Um, I'm, I'm saying, so we got the, the north-south drive east of the building that's right next to the ring road. If we eliminate those five spots, what we can do is we can shift that drive farther west, closer to the building, right? And by doing that, you're getting more separation from the ring road. And because of that, the radius gets bigger, the radius gets bigger so you can actually move that uh, entrance drive at the southeast farther north, and you can actually get cars to sit there and look and have a lot better sight distances on that. That's, that's my thought. So, well, I mean, realistically, those five spaces against the back of the building – and you know, if they're not employees parking there, they're probably not going to get used much, you know. They, yeah, and it, it just opens that whole area right. up more with, you know, more landscaping along the ring road. And I think it's just a better place. And, and if you did that, Andy, too, then that northern driveway, you know, if the bypass lane did want to have an opportunity to turn out, it would work better because, like you said, it's kind of angled and it's kind of forced there right now. Yeah, right. So that might work better. You think we could have... Um uh, staff work with the uh, petitioner yeah. to affect that change? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously you have your interests, you know, and, and you know, I think you've heard our input. I, I'd love to see some type of fix, you know, get better separation from that main intersection. Well, I'm, my, my purpose in saying that is uh, I'd like to see this move forward and not Correct. held up. Yeah, and, I agree. And if, if, if it's something that staff can work out administratively with the uh, petitioner, um, I'm thinking that that's the way to go. Yep. Yeah, two more things. So I definitely concur with the on that south end. I mean that dumps. I mean the I understand the north end, the dumpster enclosure, the proximity to what's assumed going to be a restaurant. But that other dumpster enclosure on that corner is just not a good idea. And, and to be honest, that kind of isolated landscape island that's right in the southeast corner of the building, I really don't see. What, I'd I'd rather see that swap. I'd rather well, see you're that going with the uh, removal of those those uh, parking spaces. 
Well, right. Uh, well, a lot of things change. can change then. But yeah, even if the spaces didn't go, I think you could swap that landscape island with, you know, get the dumpster enclosure over fairly close to the building, I guess facing east to the service drive. And then you get a nice canopy tree on the corner that, you know, I know we've had concerns about too much landscaping at turns and everything, but if it's just a, a you know, if it's more of a, a canopy tree, then you're not, you know, creating an obstruction down at the ground level. And I, that, I mean, that dumpster enclosure just doesn't do anything down on that hard curve there. So that, and then your handicap spots, are, I mean, those are spread out nicely on the front. Just remember one of the three has to be van accessible. So I'd probably recommend the center one, you know. Anyone else? So if Jonathan, if parking's an issue where they need that, I mean, I don't know if there's a way of working with Meyer because there's so much excess parking in the Meyer parking lot that maybe they could utilize some such, some type of shared parking agreement. I think the clean that up. Um, petitioner addressed this a little bit, but <clears throat> what what can happen is a uh, a user, typically a national user, has a standard required number of spaces they want to have. And that's independent of what the zoning code requires. It's independent of what and I understand. probably realistically will be used. But <coughs> uh, from the owner's perspective or the developer's perspective, um, you know, they might know these spots in the back won't likely be used, or maybe they're used for employees. But I think sometimes they just have to have a, <coughs> a parking number to, to uh, demonstrate to. But I'd like you to challenge that, though, because I think this would be a better plan if we eliminated those five spots. And there's so much parking in Meyer that, you know, and Meyer's selling the property too, so hopefully they'd be willing to work with them on some type of shared, shared parking if they need to get to a number, you know. <laughs> I, I, t I agree that the, if the workers could park off-site, because it's not really off-site, it's just the other side of the ring road. So that's fine. And I do have uh, two questions to staff. Uh, in the report for lighting, uh, that uh, you need to see the lot fixtures to make sure they were similar in color and style. Has that been done? It's, it's, have uh, you seen that and that's all fine? No, that's that's um, kind of a detail that I, I still want to take a look at in the future. So you need to work still with the applicant to do that? And my question to you is, that's okay For with you? Building the, you know, the other lots, the other lots are already up and so the same spec will be used here and um, we're trying to make it a unified development and use the same ones that, uh, or s at least the same style that Myers uses, so. And that, that brings me to the other question I have. Meyer has, um, I don't know, peaked roofs, parapets, I don't know, what, what do you want, whatever you call them. And about every development that we, is out there has some sort of a peak roof and I know this is flat. I also know that you have the pair puts hiding the things but I just want to ask the question is there anything where a peaked roof or a, even like a clock tower because that's the one uh, place we don't have a clock tower yet in developments because well um, I actually worked on the, um, the plan development development for Meyer back in 2004 and uh, staff's intent collectively as the village not, I'm not uh, trying to represent this as my own but our intent was to provide uh, some tools uh, and some suggestions for the various outlaw developments to have uh, some con compatibility to be a family of buildings without being a cookie cutter or all having to be uh, uniform uh, and so some of the suggestions some of the ways of complying with the plan development were to incorporate uh, similar colors uh, similar materials uh, and a variety of, of other methods um, so a couple of the aspects uh, here uh, that reflect uh, or speak to the original Meyer building include the um, standing seam awnings here. It's a similar material as uh, the um, uh, canopy feature that, that Meyer has, uh, as well as uh, the wainscoting and, and some of the building materials. So there are, uh, in, in staff's opinion, uh, some compatibility uh, with the plan development without the requirement for uniformity. Um, I certainly appreciate the, the question and the suggestion. I understand uh, what you're um, what you're raising as a, a point of consideration. Yeah, because most of the buildings there have at least one raised well, roof or peak roof or something that's just decorative, high and decorative. Anything else? 
not then the chair would welcome a motion regarding the uh, site plan review. I move we recommend approval of site plan review for the proposed uh, Plainfield Meyer Plaza 3 development on lot 3 of the Meyer Plainfield subdivision falling to uh, falling to the subject to the following two stipulations highlighted in staff's report but I'd also like to add a third saying that um, staff is going to work with the applicant in regards to making some improvements to the access points on the ring road. I'll second that. A motion has been made and seconded to recommend to the village board the approval of the site plan review for the proposed Meyer, uh, Plainfield Meyer Plaza 3 development on lot 3 of the Meyer Plainfield subdivision, subject to the two stipulations found in the planner's report and the third stipulation. Uh, as uh, determined by the uh, plan commission. Do you have that third stipulation, uh, Marley? Okay. Vote by roll call, please. Mr. Kiefer? Yes. Mr. Renzi? Yes. Mr. Segerbrook? Yes. Mr. Paris? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Heinen? Yes. Chairman Subkoviak? Yes. Motion to uh, recommend approval of the site plan review is carried. Regarding the uh, special use permit for a drive through window. I'll move that uh, we adopt the findings of fact of staff as the findings of fact of the Planning Commission and furthermore recommend development of the special use for a drive through window for the Plainfield Meyer Plaza development on lot three of the Meyer Plainfield subdivision. I'll second that. A motion has been made and seconded to recommend to the village board that we adopt the findings of fact of staff as the findings of fact of the Planning Commission and furthermore recommend the approval of the special use uh, for a drive through window for the Plainfield Meyer Plaza development on lot three of the Meyer Plainfield subdivision. Vote by roll call, please. Mr. Renzi? Yes. Mr. Paris? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Heinen? Yes. Commissioner Kiefer? Yes. Commissioner Segerbrook? Yes. Chairman Sipkowiak? Yes. The, the motion to uh, approve, uh, recommend approval of the special use for the drive through window is carried. Both of these recommendations will go forward to the village board uh, and be available for their uh, um, consideration at their next meeting. However, be in touch with staff to ensure what night you're actually on their agenda. Good luck with your project. Anybody need a break or will we just run through? We're rolling. Case number 1712-010716. SAMU Union. This is a, a request for a special use permit for a uh, Parkland Preparatory Academy on 127th Street uh, West out by the uh, Swigel Fire Department. Staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and as with the first two cases this evening, uh, this case uh, involves a public hearing. Uh, that is a uh, public hearing re required for the special use request and uh, staff would ask that the re record reflect that the appropriate notices have been uh, mailed and, and uh, pub published in accordance with state statute and local ordinance. Um, in terms of the site context, uh, the subject site is in the far northwest uh, quadrant of the village. Uh, it's uh, north of 127th Street and west of Ridge Road, uh, generally at the um, northeast corner of Gilmore Road and uh, 127th Street. Uh, the proposed project is a therapeutic day school um, uh, to be located in an existing building. This is a, a building that the uh, Planning Commission and the Village Board approved, I believe, back in 2006 uh, for a daycare. It's a uh, part of a subdivision that was uh, brought into the village uh, as part of the uh, Oswego Fire Protection District, their station number four. Um, the um <coughs> uh, daycare use uh, has closed and, and the site has been dormant for some time. And um, so the school use uh, requires a, a special use approval um, by virtue that the, uh, it's a little bit different from the original daycare proposal and also as well the daycare proposal uh, use had been uh, dormant so there's uh, no vesting or uh, continuation of that past um, daycare use. In terms of uh, the site context, uh, the property 
To the north and east is uh, undeveloped or agricultural. Uh, interestingly, it is uh, zoned R4, and it's approved for a, a quite ambitious uh, condo and, and townhome development um, that was kind of entitled uh, way back when, uh, approximately 10 years ago. Um, to the uh, farther to the east, uh, the northwest uh, quadrant of Ridge Road and 127th Street is approved for commercial. So, uh, in the uh, longer term, uh, the comprehensive plan uh, kind of identifies that as being a uh, more of a regional commercial or a, a very strong commercial corner. Uh, to the south, uh, southwest corner, we've got some land approved for commercial uh, apartments as well as single family uh, residential. So this is kind of the northern tip of, of Grand Park. We've gone south to north tonight. Um, the uh, applicant did submit a letter uh, or an outline of the uh, proposed school use. It's included uh, as a, an attachment to the staff report. Um, so I'll just kind of summarize what the proposed use is before uh, getting into the uh, special use analysis. Uh, the uh, operator, uh, Parkland Preparatory Academy, is uh, an existing uh, organization. They have a, a site in Streamwood currently, and they're proposing to uh, provide uh, daytime school uh, education needs uh, for special needs students that uh, aren't um, best accommodated by the public school system. So. Uh, this is an outfit that uh, kind of specializes and, and is able to um, provide an educational experience for these students that um, uh, is a better match than, than uh, in the, in the uh, school districts. Um, the uh, site is proposed for uh, approximately 50 students, um, uh, uh, an enrollment of uh, approximately 50 students uh, per day during the year and uh, would operate uh, weekdays uh, 8.45 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, given that the site was originally approved for a, a daycare, uh, all the parking, kind of the circulation, the drop-off and pick-up um, is already in place. So the uh, building and the site itself is uh, fairly well uh, suited. And uh, in, in staff's opinion, it's a great, uh, great user to come into this uh, location that's been dark uh, for a number of years. So returning to the uh, staff report, uh, again, the analysis is the same as uh, our last case here, the two findings of fact for the special use. Uh, one is that the special use would not be injurious to use and enjoyment of adjacent properties, uh, nor would it substantially diminish uh, property values. Uh, staff uh, does not foresee any negative impacts from the potential use uh, that would be of detriment to adjacent properties. Um, we have, you know, to the north and, and east, uh, vacant, uh, but long-term plan for, uh, for uh, residential and uh, commercial. Uh, staff believes the school use would be compatible with, with, uh, with those future uses. And likewise, to the south, the existing uh, residential uses. Staff does not see any, uh, foresee any uh, negative impacts. Uh, the traffic would be fairly limited uh, during um, you know, certain times and uh, compatible with uh, traffic that was experienced by a prior use uh, that was approved by the village. Uh, secondly, uh, the finding of fact would be that the establishment of the special use will not impede uh, normal and orderly development and improvement of adjacent properties uh, for uses in the uh, subject zoning district. Uh, so staff again feels that the uh, school use would be compatible uh, with the future residential development to the north and east and as well as the uh, more intense commercial development uh, at the corner of uh, Ridge and 127th Street. Um, so in, uh, in summary, um, staff believes that there is uh, information and evidence to support uh, the findings of fact uh, that would be required to recommend approval. And uh, so therefore staff would be seeking a favorable recommendation. And that concludes the staff report. Thank you. Who's representing the uh, petitioner tonight? Good evening, Commissioner. Oh, excuse me. Uh, do you have someone with you also? I also do. So do you want to swear? Okay, yeah, please uh, stand, raise your right hands, please. Is any testimony you give tonight the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you? I do. Okay, thank you. Uh, when you step up to the microphone, please state your name and spell it for our recording secretary, and then go ahead with your comments. Uh, good evening. My name is Patty Bernhard, B-E-R-N-H-A-R-D, and I'm with the law firm of Dahmermuth um, at all. I'm not going to name all of us. There's too many on our name now. but. Um, uh, we represent uh, 127th Street Plainfield LLC, uh, who is the applicant on this property, but I have with me the tenant. Um, David Russo is going to be um, speaking 
with regard to the Parkland Preparatory Academy um, and give you some information about uh, the school and also talk a little bit about the site plan. Um, so if at any time you have questions for me or for him, um, we'd be more than happy to answer those questions for you. Um, again, Jonathan always does a great job with his staff report. It's uh, very thorough, so I don't really have much to add. Um, uh, but I just want to make sure that I, I have everything on the record here. So the property, as Jonathan stated, is on the north side of 127th Street and east of Gilmore Road uh, with a property address of 27040 West 127th Street. Um, it is zoned R1 currently, um, and there is um, an existing building on the property. Uh, the, what we're seeking tonight is approval of a special use for a therapeutic day school. And um, again, the name of the uh, school is Parkland Preparatory Academy, and Mr. Russo will speak uh, with regard to the school. Um, the property uh, is already an existing building. Um, it's on a one-acre parcel, approximately a one-acre parcel. Uh, Jonathan did mention the uses that surround the property, um, and we are in complete agreement with um, uh, his uh, standards, his findings of fact that there will be no uh, detrimental effect to any of the property that uh, surrounds this facility. Um, again, it was constructed as a daycare facility, so really the use that we have um, coming in here is perfect for uh, the use that that was existing currently and that has been approved or that was approved by the village um, the existing building um, it, but this is a great use of an existing building um, that has been vacant for a while so uh, we think it's a win-win for the village of Plainfield to get um, this uh, school to come in and um, utilize that that existing location uh, again, I'd like to thank Jonathan for the great staff report, um, very thorough, and uh, introduce David Russo at this time so he can discuss the site plan with you and also um, the operations of uh, the uh, Parkland Preparatory. David Russo, RUSSO 900 South Park Boulevard, Streamwood. Illinois Parkland Preparatory Group. Um, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, we feel real lucky to find a building like this. Uh, we serve special needs children from ages 5 to 21 that are referred to us by the public school system. In fact, they remain students of the schools they come from. They are children who have ranged from extreme anxiety disorders, Down syndrome, bipolar, um, and all across the autistic spectrum. We currently have two schools, one in Streamwood serving uh, 140 children at the moment, one in Oak Lawn that is at 80. Uh, currently, we have almost 30 children who are all living within five miles of this building, spending over an hour, hour and 10 minutes driving up to Streamwood and transported, by the way, by the school district. So we see this location as not only advantageous for us in terms of a Southwest presence, but also our existing districts that will cut their transportation times by easily 50%, if not more than that. Um, our hours of operations are nine to three. We do not have evening programs like a regular school system would, with the exception of a parent's night in the fall. There are no weekend events, athletic activities we participate in what's called a Cal League, which is a special needs district. Those activities take place during the day, uh, not after school hours uh, or weekends. Um, our staff typically starts arriving around 7, 7.30, is usually out by 5. Students are 9 to, or, uh, nine to 3. Um, we typically draw, believe it or not, students from a 25-mile radius. So. It, uh, it is not uncommon for us, for example, to, to have a student or two students from Morris, Illinois. It won't be uncommon for them to come from, in fact, we have kids coming from DeKalb now. Uh, the reason we so much love this building is actually lays out like a school. 
the interior of this has wide hallways, big classrooms. It's not your typical kind of a kinder care setup where it's kind of smaller for real small children, um, which makes it great for us. Um, the other thing is that the, the, how it is laid out very much accommodates our kids, especially with the play yards. Almost 65% of our children are eighth grade and under right now. And that's been a big transition over the last five uh, to 10 years, where it used to be therapeutic days had older kids, 14 to 18. Because of early inter er intervention programs now, these children are getting in quicker and being able to transition, which is our goal, back to their public schools. Um, from a staffing requirement, we would have no more than 60 children here. Uh, staffing would be no more uh, than probably 15 to 16, depending on uh, the therapeutic staff, uh, if we need an additional speech pathologist or uh, occupational therapist. And from a pickup drop up point of view, parents do not drop off, kids do not come to school. They are transported typically in a SEPTRAN uh, SUV and or a uh, short bus. And if there's any questions you have, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer them. And we are Illinois State Board of Educated, regulated uh, by ISB. Okay, thank you, Mr. Russo. Is there anyone in the audience who care to ask a question or make a comment regarding uh, this special use request? Okay, with that, uh, let the record show that there was no response. Uh, with that, then staff, I um, mean, um, the commissioners are free to uh, ask questions of staff or uh, the petitioner. Jonathan? <coughs> When the building was originally built, was there traffic impact analysis done to see uh, if the trips would require anything like uh, upgrades to the streets, traffic signals on nearby intersections, or anything like that? No. Uh, at that time, I think the magnitude of the development uh, was was so small that such that a uh, traffic study wasn't required. And uh, furthermore, at the time, the uh, Grand Park developer uh, was making improvements to 127th Street, so uh, it was uh, improved uh, kind of. Uh, concurrently with the uh, the proposal so it had been improved by the developer the street already and um, they proposed to have fewer students and fewer trips per day than what was originally proposed for the original uh, usage of the building correct, correct. Mm -hmm. okay. if there's a, there's less than half a student half the population is going to be attending at this time as opposed to what was in the daycare facility that's correct, and again, keeping in mind that well, typically at a daycare, uh, parents uh, bring mo bring most of the cars, children. Most yeah, uh, now at, at lunchtime you, you may have a, um, um, a bus bringing the kids from school, or after school a bus bringing the kids in. But for the most part, it's a, a parent drop off thing. And the the per this the petitioner is proposing virtually all of the uh, students will be brought in um, uh, contracted buses. Right. Considerably fewer trips. Yes. Of, uh, parking, is there any regulations for the number of spaces that is required of this school or anything like that? Because I don't recall seeing that and I don't remember anything from um, typically, it's it's either done uh, per classroom or um, based on the, the anticipated staff. Um, so in this case, I believe there are 25 parking spaces um, right. from memory. So um, you know more than a space per staff member that's um, uh, anticipated by the uh, petitioner. And the only real question that I have about the parking is that it tends to be fine then, except for. Uh, what four times a year when you have conferences or how how often do you, let's put it this way how often do you have student conferences where the parents would actually come and see you once a year and this is it's hard to explain sometimes because our perception when we hear the word school we relate to how our children most of our children go what we're used to our kids come from as I said upwards of 25 miles I will tell you that the parents usually have come to the school once to tour the facility, and that's it. Um, you know, the younger children who will tend to stay with us a little longer, um, maybe the parents will have come twice. Um, it's just 
does not operate uh, because the goal is we are a transitory institution for them. Hopefully we can bring them in, they're there for a year, maybe two years, and then they return to their home school. So while the kids have an incredible uh, attachment to us and the parents are happy with our performance. It's not like when you go home at night and your sons or daughters say, we've got parents conferences tonight, we've got to go. It's not that way. Um, we really have one parent night during the year and my guess is we average maybe 20% of the parents would show. Okay. Well, that's still though, if you have 60 students, that would be 15 sets of parents and there's seven spaces. Well, if so we, I, it, mean, yeah, I, I it, understand we're talking once a year. But yeah, and, and, and the implication is that the entire staff would be there that night, and that wouldn't happen either. Because our staffing, one of the things is two things. There's only 10 children per classroom. We are one of the few therapeutic days that employ two LBS1 uh, teachers, learning behavior specialists, per classroom. ISBE, the requirement is one teacher, one parapro the teachers would be there that night. So at best, you might be talking about, you know, eight to 10, uh, the lead teacher and then the secondary teachers. But it is a once a year event and uh, it just, that's really it. So basically it could be set up, I don't know, uh, like one night you could do elementary, another night you do middle school and another night you could do a high school then to ensure that we didn't have any problems? Yeah, if we saw there was a parking problem, we would absolutely institute something like that. I think one of the things in reading the immediate notes that this, w they were talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 uh, daycare kids when this was originally approved with over 100 drop-offs a day. We're going to be lucky if we've got well, 10, you know. But yes, but a drop-off is going to be maybe 15 minutes at most because it depends on whether they want to walk the child in, they're visiting with the teacher and that'd be anywhere from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. or something like that for the drop-offs. So on the one hand, yes, you're right, but it's also defined by time as opposed to a conference where normally speaking, the teacher would want to address all the parents at one time or at least there would be some overlap and they would be there for a lot longer. And, if, the, and if there was a problem, Commissioner, we, and we saw that develop, we could easily provide even a shuttle transport or actually talk to the fire protection district who usually, in both our other schools, the fire guys come over all the time because they're always kind of helping out with the kids and stuff where we can. Well, that, that's really what I'm getting at because I agree that it really is nice because I was sitting on the commission back when and I do recall like you said, there were large hallways, and so this would really be a nice facility. And I'm also a former school board member, so I know that we had to send people to Algonquin and Schaumburg and all over the place. And it'd be nice if they just simply went up the road. So that all would be nice, but I want to make sure that when we just look at all the niceness, well, you were here for the early thing. I always think of what's the worst can happen. And that's the one night I, a year I'm focusing on is the one night potentially something bad can happen in the hopes that you can address that and say, well, we can cope with it this way, that way, whatever, and it won't be a problem. And then, yeah. And you're absolutely, I mean, it, it, the sure. worst case, we just split it into grade school, middle school, high school, and you know, at no time would we should have an overage or provide additional transport if need be. We would do that. Okay. Mr. Russo, did you indicate that there's a 30, currently 30 students uh, in the immediate area that would probably attend this? I don't know if they, you know, one of the things is you can't say, oh, they'll sure. all come down because the kids do get attached, quite frankly, sure. and to the teachers and everything like that. But we serve right now 31 children that live within five miles of this facility or are currently being transported all the way to Streamwood. Well, I, I think this is an excellent uh, repurposing of an existing facility. Uh, I'm very supportive of the mission that, that you have for this facility. Uh, I, I like that it potentially will be serving our community and our community students. And I th I'm, I'm very supportive of this uh, proposal and special use. I'd agree with uh, Commissioner Kiefner on that. Um, 
just one quick question. I guess I'm, I'm a little confused, you know, from the drawing that Hager has that we're showing this um, uh, drop-off lane surrounding the building. I mean, that's that's a proposed plan. I, uh, I should have uh, addressed that in my, my presentation. I think if there was a, a concern on the part of the commission, uh, the purpose of that plan was to demonstrate that uh, if need be, uh, there's adequate room uh, on site at the facility to incorporate a dedicated uh, drop-off uh, operation uh, in the future. So I don't think not it's the, that, not right? the petitioner's intent to do that. It's merely to demonstrate that that's you need uh, it, do you? I, I, We don't, but we wanted to address staff's concerns and also our own. You know, if, if you do have a stacking problem, is there a capacity to route around that building? And we had the engineers take a look at that, and they demonstrated that. But no, I... Our schools typically take about 18 months to fill up. We really believe that in addition to 202, um, you know, we know the four or five districts that we're going to have the students from, and they're all right around here, Naperville, Aurora, Plainfield, um, that those students are then bundled into five or six children in one of these transports, and, you know, it just, it, it, they all come together. And quite frankly, in the morning, there's absolutely no issue because arrival times are different. Meaning, you know, somebody starts out over here, well, one gets here, they drop the kids off, they, we take them right into school. No one sits on a bus with us. So if push came to shove and they had to put this, this drive-through lane in, you know, it's two and a half feet from the property lines. Are those setback variances then that are required? This isn't, um, that that wasn't being presented for approval as like part of a site so plan. So if this actually would plan. get built, it would come back in front of us then? Um, correct. And and frankly, uh, the drop-off issue wasn't a significant concern for staff, so I didn't put much uh, analysis okay. into that. That's but, um, but yeah, that's that's not being presented for approval down the road. It's kind Thank of you. proof of concept. I mean, that, that was my question too. With the, I mean, obviously if this... And what, by the way, it's a wonderful idea for this facility, great use of the building. I mean, if, if it did have two drive entrances out to 127th, of course, then it would be very simple to think about how the buses would circulate through. But otherwise, they're going to have to, I guess, you know, pull in and then pull into a space, back out, you know, make that kind of a turn. And, and I think one of the things, Commissioner, we're going to look at over, because like I said, these typically take anywhere from 18 to 24 months to move right. towards capacity very early on at the when we're hitting around 30 kids if we see that quite frankly i think a more viable it's to, uh, or, uh, you know solution is maybe a right in right out where as you just described there's just not that oh many. you mean oh potentially has to bring a driveway right. up to the street which i don't even know if that's possible maybe it's possible but yeah uh, we'll just never obviously that would be very efficient if it could be done uh, you know? there's just not right with a cap of 60 children we know here's plus or minus the transport vehicles right right uh, i mean and i know so there's 25 spaces i'm doesn't really show it but i'm assuming the accessible uh yeah, space is probably right there near the entrance it's i think right by the front door area there so that would add up to the 25 but i assume the little bus would kind of pull up right to that area and let them off right there anyway and then probably let the kids off first and then make their turn and t get turned around and it is a very staggered arrival right just yeah. because if you're starting for example in yorkville or you're starting right. in, you know across the street they're not all going to be there at the same time no and no parents are allowed you know their the parents do not drop kids off it right. is all district transport and the only other question i had is i mean in the kind of in the back of the building e even if the the additional service drive is not needed i mean is the playground that's there adequate or do you think you might enlarge it or change it yeah or? i think it is I, you know i was thinking about maybe in the winter we should put a tent up for the kids <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you know throw a space heater with a basketball right. thing out there or something but right. yeah i think it is uh okay. you know especially because our age has right. gone down so dramatically. You know, if I was here five years ago, I'd be telling you 90% of right. our kids were 14 to 18. It's right. just no longer the case. Okay. So one thing you mentioned was a right in, right out, you know, having on the east side of your site. I mean, I think that's a good concept, but it may cause some issues uh, with the development just to the east of that. And maybe there's, and I don't know if you know the owners of that property, but maybe there's a shared access you could have that could be the benefit of not only your property, but the property to the east of you, too. So something to think of. Anybody else? And a motion. No, if, if we're ready, I'm ready. 
I'd like to move that we adopt the findings of fact of staff as the findings of fact of the plan commission and furthermore move to recommend approval of the special use for the proposed Parkland Preparatory Academy at 27040 West 127th Street for up to 60 students. Second the motion. Motion's been made and seconded to recommend to the village board that uh, the plan commission adopt the findings of fact of staff as the findings of fact of the plan commission and furthermore move to recommend approval of the special use for the proposed Parkland Preparatory Academy at 27040 West 127th Street for up to 60 students. Vote by roll call, please. Mr. Heinen. Yes. Mr. Renzi. Yes. Mr. Sagerbrook. Yes. Mr. Paris. Yes. Mr. Green. Yes. Mr. Kiefer. Yes. Chairman Spokoviak. Yes. Uh, the motion to recommend a, uh, approval of the special use is carried. This will go forward to the village board for their consideration uh, by the time of their next meeting. However, due to um, uh, workload and, and pressures of, uh, of things, uh, be in touch with staff to find out what night you're actually on their agenda. Good luck with your endeavor. Uh, there's uh, an issue has come up uh, regarding um, timely uh, conveyance of our uh, discussions and decisions to the plan commission and um, uh, John Renzi here has come up with a plan and he's talked it over with uh, John uh, Jonathan and it seems like the way to go uh, Jonathan you want to fill us in on this Sure, just to um, kind of summarize and, and certainly invite uh, Commissioner Renzi's input as well um, one of the byproducts of the uh, recent joint meeting that the uh, Planning Commission held with the Village Board was a suggestion by uh, Trustee Lamb uh, or a, an issue identified of, of, hey, let's make sure that the trustees, the mayor and trustees are uh, really kept in the loop on uh, some of the most salient, most important uh, aspects of the Planning Commission consideration. Uh, in my view, the, you know, the Planning Commission does really the heavy lifting, conducting the public hearing, uh, separating the wheat from the chaff and, and uh, getting to the real heart of things. Um, but. Um, I think there's also the interest in making sure that the village board kind of gets the tone and tenor of, of uh, some of uh, of those discussions so that it's not a, a simple hey if the plan commission recommends approval you know everything is great there there may be a couple important facts that the commission uh, really wants to make sure are addressed and I could even point to some examples from the three cases we had tonight um, so it's staff's intent and I know uh, Commissioner Renzi had uh, some suggestions as well <coughs> uh, but the, the uh, uh, thought is to introduce uh, a transmittal recommendation from the uh, plan commission. It could be something as simple as a one page recommendation that would include information such as uh, the date the case was considered by the plan commission, uh, whether a public hearing was involved in the case, uh, the number of people who participated in the public hearing, and that, you know, it could be meaningful, it, it could not. I mean, if, if there are 20 people, you might think the case is controversial, but maybe all 20 came to say it was a great thing. Uh, there would be a, a spot for uh, uh, any additional um, open items or details that the plan commission would like addressed uh, prior to the village board. Um, that's not to say that those items couldn't also be stipulations of approval. Uh, so, for example, tonight there's a stipulation on a case to address the, um, the ingress, egress, the curb cuts. Um, staff's not suggesting that this transmittal, kind of these summary issues are to replace any stipulations. It's really uh, an additional a supplement as well as uh, uh, opportunity to uh, attach draft minutes or minutes in whatever form, whether they've been approved by the plan commission or uh, still in draft form. So it's really intended to be a, um, a mechanism to standardize uh, how the summary of plan commission uh, consideration is uh, presented to the village board. So if you have multiple planners uh, doing things, this is kind of a standardized format. Uh, as well as to kind of institutionalize it so as personnel changes from you know time to time we've got we've got kind of a, a practice in place that uh, hopefully the planning commission has confidence in and, and that the village board finds valuable um, so it's really staff's attempt to address the uh, suggestions from uh, trustee lamb uh, as well as uh, commissioner renzi and, and outlining some um, some ways to um, achieve that goal the intent is really to make sure that the village board get some sort of feedback from us other than waiting for the official well, yeah, approval see, of minutes and we understand the timeline with that it's two weeks away yeah and and they meet the na night before us so uh they the problem is the min the minutes are not, not been approved have not been approved 
until the night after the meeting. So uh, I'll let we change it so we do have plan commission on Mondays and board on Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> what do you laugh? Why are you You're laughing? You're messing with tradition here now. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> you, well, you ain't going to change the village board. Well, I, I like that this addresses some of those concerns. I, 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 I think, think it's worth trying to see how it works out. Well, the other thing, too, was that we would submit not minutes but quote unquote minutes and there would be language that the minutes have been unapproved unreviewed but at least for the most part it, it, it will identify realistically the changes like that we do come up with yeah, yes the exactly. amendments that we make are are kind of uh, of, of little consequence i won't say unimportant but they're of little consequence uh, to the uh, to the uh, end, end the, the end decision the other thing, though, is uh, the trustees can ask for a copy of the draft minutes before. Uh, yeah, because I know some of the trustees have done that when it's been more controversial, too. So I think could attend our meetings. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, ju I'm just thinking, though, that the best thing to do, again, I can't get away from being a lawyer, is to simply s systematize everything. So that way, because I think I started, there were like five planners, maybe six planners. And yeah, yeah, and so what we want to do then is continuity. I think have, have exactly. So we have the one form with check the blanks. So if I'm a trustee or you're a trustee, okay, they can just look through it. Like for instance, issues that came up like with Play La Vista. Well, if you look at the vote and you look at the things, there won't be any discussion about well, should there have been any ranch designs that were for the larger lots and there won't be any discussion on well do you really want to have vinyl siding and there won't be any discussion again about well we had a little bit about discussion of the size of lots but i'm figuring maybe that like you indicated well maybe that would so you know it's a sub issue maybe and that way it kind of as if we are before the trustees again because they can see oh this is the first time this issue has come up or this is the seventh time this issue has been spoken to we really need to identify what is the priority about this particular thing and so that way it kind of is a meeting without a meeting that's that's the goal of the forum and it also yeah, gives continuity you feel comfortable you can implement this without Certainly, staff. it's it's um you know what what I'm uh, proposing is really just a one page uh, thing. I, I would have liked to have a sample for you, but I just wasn't wasn't able to get to it. But uh, it's not replacing. I, I would attach the the minutes in whatever form they are as well. Uh, but really want to streamline and simplify uh, for the village board, distill everything down, but also give the plan commission a vehicle for you to say, hey, even though we're recommending approval, just take a second look, and and as you as commissioners or as a commission identify those issues you'll know okay this is going to land on the you know on the little summary issues section of this uh, transmittal so it just gives a little bit more i like the idea behind it I'm, i'd like to see it attempted see how it works out anybody got anybody else have anything for the good of the cause hey thanks for coming guys we're adjourned thanks marilee thanks jan